Welcome to the Three Minute Read podcast. I'm John Dalton, editor of the twice monthly newsletter of the Healing American Healthcare Coalition. Joining me once again is Ed Eichhorn, the coalition's co founder and co author of Healing American Healthcare a plan to provide quality care to all while saving one trillion a year. Hi, John. Together, we have nearly a century of healthcare experience, and we're still trying to figure it out. You can find our background and contact information at the end of the podcast. Ed and I launched the Three Minute Read in March 2020 to summarize some of the critical issues affecting busy clinicians and physicians as they've struggled through the pandemic. Today, 18 months into the worst global pandemic in more than a century, we're here to discuss our 35th issue of the Three Minute Read. As a real treat for our readers and listeners, we also have compiled a special report to share with you a look back at the past 18 months and some of the highlights and lowlights. So let's dig in. The July 1st issue summarized six recent articles on three topics. The first topic was the potential threat being posed by the Delta variant that first surfaced in India, and we discussed that on our prior podcast at the end of April. The latest information on long-haul COVID, though unfortunately, uh, once you're over the infection, you may not be over the disease. And the third is the alarming decrease in American life expectancy as a result in part of the pandemic. The special report, on the other hand, focuses on the 37 member nations of the organization of economic cooperation and development, and how they performed throughout the pandemic thus far, including a deeper dive into American performance. So let's begin by looking at the threat posed by the Delta variant. Our first article is from Fox News, titled, Delta COVID-19 variant doubles risk of hospitalization compared to alpha strain, a Scottish study finds. It was written by Alexandria Hine, and uh, the Public Health Scotland compiled the report. So, conducted from April 1st to June 6, 2021, <clears throat> the study reported that, that the Delta variant, uh, which we first learned was B1.617.2, had become the dominant strain in Scotland and was about twice as likely to result in hospitalization than the Alpha variant, the one we first identified as B1.1. That's the one that began raging in Britain December last year, in January of this year. The World Health Organization now has started to use Greek letters to denote the, the variants. The Delta variant was more prevalent in younger and more affluent groups than others. And both the AstraZeneca and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines did cut the risk of infection and hospitalization due to the Delta variant. The study did not have any information on the Moderna vaccine because that's not widely used in the United Kingdom. But both the AstraZeneca and Pfizer-BioNTech appear to be effective uh, against the Delta variant. The article, the study was published June 14th in The Lancet, the, that prestigious British medical journal. And in that article, the authors commented, quote, given the observational nature of these data, estimates of vaccine effectiveness need to be interpreted with caution. The next article on the Delta variant comes from the World Health Organization, or from CNBC, and it's the World Health Organization says Delta is the fastest and fittest COVID variant and will, quote, pick off the most vulnerable. And it's written by Berkeley Level Ace Jr. And in the photo you see Dr. Michael Ryan from the World Health Organization. It was first identified in India, but the Delta variant has now spread to 92 countries, replacing the highly contagious Alpha variant that, as we noted earlier, swept across Europe and then later the US earlier this year. According to Dr. Michael Ryan, who is the Executive Director of the World Health Organization Health Emergencies Program and a very prominent figure throughout this pandemic, quote, this particular Delta variant is faster, it is fitter, it will pick off the more vulnerable more efficiently than previous variants. That's a five alarm fire. Ryan said world leaders and public health officials can help defend the most vulnerable through the donation and distribution of COVID vaccines. He described the fact that we have it as, quote, a catastrophic moral failure at a global level. Well, Concurrent with uh, 
release of this article, the Biden administration announced its donation of 55 million vaccine doses. In fact, it was announced prior to the, uh, the article. Most of them will be distributed to COVAX, the WHO-backed immunization program. Ed, do you have an update? Yes, I think it's important to share that at the G7 summit that occurred after this interview, President Biden agreed to dosages to 500 million, with 200 million going out before the end of 2021 and another 300 million going out next year. And the United States will also donate $4 billion to COVAX to help cover the cost of distribution and administration of uh, the vaccines. So it's a great increase. And in addition to that, the G7 nations agreed to match the United States donation. And these two large donations will go a long way to beginning to uh, help uh, the 80 nations uh, that are lower middle income nations to vaccinate their populations. That's it. The, the final article on uh, the Delta variant theme comes from the Associated Press. They've concluded that nearly all COVID deaths in the U.S are now among the unvaccinated. It was written by Carla K. Johnson and Mike Stubby, and the image is that of Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the current head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The AP's analysis of available government data from May shows that breakthrough infections in fully vaccinated people accounted for fewer than 1,200 of the more than 850,000 COVID-19 hospitalizations. That's a very small decimal fraction. And as you know, breakthrough infections are when a vaccinated person contracts the particular disease they've been vaccinated against. In all of the vaccines, there are some level of breakthrough infections. The good news is that they typically are relatively mild and sometimes asymptomatic, unlike being infected when you're unvaccinated. Deaths in the U.S. have plummeted from a peak of more than 3,400 a day on average in mid-January to less than 300 per day now. And that's good news. That's uh, really pushing the curve down. Only about 150 of May's more than 18,000 COVID-19 deaths were in fully vaccinated people. So more than 99% of COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. now are among the unvaccinated. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said during a White House coronavirus briefing that the vaccine is so effective that, quote, nearly every death, especially among adults due to COVID-19, is at this point entirely preventable. She called such deaths particularly tragic. Experts predict that preventable deaths will continue with unvaccinated pockets of the nation having outbreaks next fall and winter. The University of Washington's modeling suggests that the U.S. will hit 1,000 deaths per day next winter. And you may recall that uh, it was last spring, spring of 2020, that uh, the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics gave its modeling forecast of uh, somewhere between 100,000 and 240,000 deaths in America, even with mitigation strategies. And that's pretty much what shocked the Trump administration into some awareness that uh, this really was a serious event that we were fighting. Our take, heed your doctor's life-saving advice. If you haven't already done so, get vaccinated. The life you save may be your own. Ed, you've got an update. Yes, CNN recently interviewed Dr. Fauci, and he warned that there may soon be two Americas as the divide widens between vaccinated and unvaccinated areas. With the Delta variant accounting for more than a quarter of COVID-19 cases, Dr. Fauci warns that there soon could be two Americas, one where most people are vaccinated and another where low vaccination rates could lead to spikes in cases. The stark disparity between low and high vaccination areas is something Dr. Fauci is very concerned about, as he told uh, CNN's Don Lemon on his uh, recent interview. And, you know, this underlines the importance of trying to reach herd immunity. Theoretically, this occurs when 70 to 80 percent of a nation's population are uh, vaccinated. 
Uh, and it occurs in areas and would spread across the country. In the United States, the Northeast looks like it's getting close to herd immunity, and so are some areas on the West Coast. But the South Central states of the United States have very low vaccination rates. And this is the concern that Dr. Fauci has about two Americas. And in fact, given the spread of the Delta virus that John has been reporting on today, if you look at the two-week rolling average as reported in the New York Times, today is the first day in a very long time that the average actually has gone up by 15%. And this should be an area of concern for public health officials throughout the nation, but especially in those states with very low vaccination rates. Thank you, Ed. So as Dr. Mike Ryan said, it's the fastest and the fittest, and it's, it's flying fast. So our next topic looks at once you've beaten the infection, is the game over? Not the news. This is from CNBC on June 17th. New COVID study hints at a long-term loss of brain tissue. Dr. Scott Gottlieb warns. COVID in the brain. So citing a new study from the United Kingdom, former FDA director Dr. Scott Gottlieb warned about the potential for long-term brain loss post-COVID. He stated, quote, the study suggests that there could be some long-term loss of brainish tissue from COVID, and that would have some long-term consequences. The UK study examined brain imaging before and after a coronavirus infection and looked specifically at the potential effect on the nervous system. Gottlieb said that the destruction of brain tissue could explain why COVID patients lost their sense of smell. And as we reported earlier, uh, anosmia or the loss of the sense of smell was one of the key indicia that a patient or person was infected with COVID. Next up, the CDC recognizes COVID long haulers. They finally have issued new guidance for treating COVID-19 long haulers and they warn against relying on labs and imaging results alone. As you know, Gottlieb commented, most of the evidence they looked at were imaging uh, results. This was written by Dave Muio of Fierce Healthcare and it appeared on June 17th. The CDC has released interim guidance for those healthcare providers treating patients with post-COVID conditions. The long haul conditions are a wide range of physical and mental health issues that sometimes persist four or more weeks after a COVID-19 infection. According to the CDC, Many of the patient's post-COVID conditions can be managed by primary care providers. That's a good indication because most of us do have a primary care physician who coordinates our care and directs us when we need specialized uh, assistance. Long COVID conditions include heart palpitations, cognitive impairment or brain fog, insomnia, diarrhea, and post-exertional malaise, a worsening of symptoms following physical or mental exertion. The CDC warned against relying on diagnostic results as the only means of assessing a patient's condition. Quote, lack of laboratory or imaging abnormalities does not invalidate the existence, severity, or importance of a patient's symptoms or conditions. The agency said it, quote, will continue to work in collaboration with federal, state, local, academic, and community partners to better understand the long-term effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Concurrently, uh, the article cited a study by Fair Health. Fair Health has an enormous database of health insurance claims that they mine continually to determine and analyze for various conditions. Their study found that more than 23% of patients who had a COVID-19 infection experienced one or more post-COVID conditions 30 days after their initial diagnosis. So while they beat the infection, they still had some residual effects. Pain, breathing difficulties, hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol, malaise and fatigue and hypertension were the five most common post-COVID conditions and alarmingly were more common among females than males. The infections, as we've learned over the course of the pandemic, tend to hit males harder, but the post-COVID conditions seem to be much more prevalent among females than males. The study also found a higher risk of mortality after acute treatment. Our take, for nearly one out of four COVID survivors, beating the infection is not the end of the battle. The war continues. For some, symptoms continue to persist and may last for years. 
preventing the next pandemic should be the number one priority on America's public health agenda. And Ed, I think you have an update to add. Yes, when we think about one out of four being a long haulers, I don't think that brings the reality to the forefront. So basically one in four or 23% of the patients who develop uh, long haul symptoms means that between seven and nine million Americans are suffering with long haul symptoms. And this is a very difficult, large number that needs a great deal of care. And hopefully the researchers and physicians treating them will help them to eliminate their symptoms earlier rather than later. But that's still a very large number of people suffering after having the COVID infection. Yeah, the three minute read first noted this issue back in August of 2020 in, in an article that described a 38 year old British neuroscientist who was unable to return to work even uh, at the time of the publication of the article. Mm-hmm. She uh, a brilliant woman uh, suffering from brain fog as a post COVID syndrome. Don't have any updates as to whether she finally shed the, the symptoms, but this is not new news. Uh, that issue also had an article from Mount Sinai in New York talking about setting up clinics and whatnot to deal with long COVID symptoms. So this is one of the lingering effects of the COVID pandemic. The final topic in this issue of Three Minute Read deals with the alarming drop in U.S. life expectancy. This is from NPR, an article entitled, The Pandemic Led to the Biggest Drop in U.S. Life Expectancy Since World War II, study finds. It was written by Allison Aubrey from NPR on June 23rd, 2021. And the chart below is kind of small, but you can see the trend. The blue line is composite of high-income nations, and the green line, unfortunately, is America. And as you can see, we we peaked about here and the then flat line, then we've been in a decline, an alarming decline. Uh, this study was published in the British Medical Journal, and it indicates that life expectancy in the U.S. has declined from 78.9 years in 2014 to 76.9 years at year-end 2020. African Americans and Hispanic Americans were especially hard hit with declines of 3.3 and 3.9 years, respectively. Study author Stephen Wolf is from Virginia Commonwealth University of Medicine. He stated, quote, we have not seen a decrease like this since World War II. It's a horrific decrease in life expectancy. Wolf further noted that disruptions in behavioral health and chronic disease management during the course of the pandemic have contributed to the decline. Leslie Curtis, chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences at Duke University School of Medicine commented, Quote, it is impossible to look at these findings and not see a reflection of the systemic racism in the United States. Dr. Richard Besser, president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation here in Princeton, New Jersey said, quote, this study further destroys the myth that the United States is the healthiest place in the world to live. For example, life expectancy in Princeton, New Jersey, a predominantly white community, is 14 years higher than Trenton, New Jersey, a predominantly black and Latino city only 14 miles away. 14 years difference in life expectancy. The U.S. has been losing ground compared with other wealthy countries, said Magali Barbieri of the University of California, Berkeley, in an editorial that was published alongside the new study. Wolf concluded, quote, the U.S. has some of the best hospitals and some of the greatest scientists, but other countries do far better in getting quality medical care to their population. We have big gaps in getting care to people who need it most when they need it most, end quote. Our take for vaccinated Americans, the COVID-19 pandemic appears to be under control. But what a toll it has taken, especially among communities of color. At December 31st, 2020, 343,818 Americans had perished. More than 260,000 have died since then. So U.S. life expectancy, it will continue to plummet. As your editor, I've often stated that America has the most thoroughly trained physicians and the best equipped hospitals in the world, but does not produce health for its population. That has to change. Ed? Well, I I think this is really important information, and the decline is, as you said, is going to continue. 
it's a startling difference when you consider a place like Princeton is only 14 miles from Trenton and the life expectancy is 14 years longer. You know, moving health care to people that need it needs to be part of the work of the current Congress. And there are bills being considered now to expand and develop a, a public option and to get health care to more people around our, our nation to help stem the tide of a, a shorter life expectancy. Well, that's it for the June issue, but we have a special treat for our readers and listeners, a look back at the global pandemic and how various OECD member countries, as well as some others, have managed, or in some cases, mangled their response to the pandemic. We'll start by looking at the timeline as the pandemic hit the world, then key data from four of the following dates. April 30, 2020, which is when Ned and I began tracking some of the, the data, June 30, 2020, halfway through the year, year end, December 31st, and then fast forward to where we were as of June 30. We celebrate the new year of 2020 with an announcement from December 31st, 2019. The government in Wuhan, China, confirmed that health authorities were treating dozens of cases of a pneumonia of unknown origin. So three weeks later, the U.S. saw its first confirmed case in Washington state, was a man in his 30s who developed symptoms after returning from Wuhan. And shortly thereafter, I think all of us can remember seeing the ambulances pulling up in front of a, a nursing home in Kirkland, Washington, where the first major outbreak had occurred. January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declares a global health emergency, named the disease COVID-19. And the way the naming convention is, is coronavirus disease discovered in 2019. In February 2020, more than 2.2 million travelers arrived in New York from Europe, some already infected with the novel coronavirus. On March 5th, here in New Jersey, we confirmed our first case. Immediately thereafter, Metro New York joined Milan and Madrid as the global epicenters of the pandemic. I don't think any of us will ever forget the ambulances and cold storage refrigerators lined up outside of uh, Queens Hospital Center in Elmhurst, and uh, the shortage of PPE and the frontline healthcare workers doing their best to treat patients with this disease that uh, looked and acted far different from any that we have seen before. On March 31st, 2020, President Trump projects up to 240,000 coronavirus deaths, even with mitigation efforts. University of Washington's Institute of Health Metrics had done their modeling, and their worst case scenario with mitigation efforts was 240,000 deaths. And on March 30th, we began monthly tracking of confirmed cases and deaths for the 37 member nations of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That is the organization of all of the developed countries in the world who have met certain economic criteria and applied for membership. So let's look at where we were April 30th. And I want to apologize for putting that densely full table on the left. That is the basically the, the core of the spreadsheet that we've been updating since April 30th. I leave that there for a couple of reasons. We'll talk about certain countries, but many of those who watch or listen to the podcast may want to look into and track what's happening with the, perhaps the country of their origin. But as of April 30th, 2020, three major points to remember. The four Pacific Rim countries, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and uh, New Zealand, were at the top of the chart. Along with Slovakia, the Slovak Republic, and Colombia in South America. The U.S. ranked 29th out of 37. Well ahead of Sweden, uh, Sweden mangled their attempt at coping with the pandemic, they first decided to try to establish herd immunity, and herd immunity because everybody gets the disease and then you're immune. But I think once realizing just how lethal the disease was, the Sweden changed course. But they were last among the four Nordic countries behind Finland, Denmark, and Norway, and they remained last. Although, as you'll see later on, the four Nordic countries as a whole have done quite well in coping with the pandemic. The worst mangler was Belgium. And if you look at the chart, the left-hand side is the fatality rate per 100,000 for 20 OECD countries. It ranged from zero to up to 80 per 100,000. This is, remember, it's just four months into the pandemic. 
So here's Belgium at nearly 70 fatality rate per thousand, followed by Spain and Italy, which should be mentioned, Milan and Madrid were the initial global epicenters of the pandemic. So the US 29 to 37 were at the top of the bottom quartile of the OECD. Two months later, June 30, 2020, here are the updated fatality rates. Now the chart ranges from zero to 90. Once again, the four Pacific Rim countries and Slovakia continued to top the chart. Colombia had dropped a bit. In a total surprise, the entire world, New Zealand at that point had completely eradicated the coronavirus. Uh, they went through a 17 day stretch with no new infections. Now, obviously it's isolated, it's an island nation, but they took some very strong steps early on. They were monitoring what was going on in Italy and they quickly realized that uh, New Zealand had a lot fewer ICU beds per capita than did Italy or the rest of the OECD. So they did have to take some pretty drastic measures pretty early and guess what, they worked. The US slipped two places to number 31 out of 37, ahead of France, Sweden, Italy, Spain, and the UK. The UK uh, is another country that kind of stumbled out of the gate, uh, but as you see later, they did recover sometime further down the line. Belgium remains at the bottom of the barrel by a wide margin, and we published a couple of articles about the Belgian experience that where, uh, despite the lethality of the infection, in Belgium, the hospitals were denying admission to patients from nursing homes. Now, in fact, ambulances were instructed not to accept critically ill patients from their care homes, which is their equivalent nursing homes. And that is what contributed to their higher death toll. At that point in time, Ed and I were betting that nobody was ever going to beat Belgium. But as you see later on, some other countries also managed to mangle their response. Now, by June 30, much had been learned about COVID-19 under desperate circumstances. I recall mid-March through the end of April, when Metro New York was just buried with the COVID cases. In New Jersey, our CMOs, chief medical officers, were having daily conferences each morning, first thing, to compare notes and share what they had learned. So we had become much more effective in treating the virus once contracted. The fatality rates were declining, but we still had uh, a great deal to, uh, to deal with. So we use June 30, 2020 as a baseline for looking at subsequent performance by countries and by states. So at June 30, this is the first time we did a deeper dive, uh, peeling back the US results and looking at individual states. So here you see some selected states and New York City as of June 30. On this chart, the blue bars are the population of the particular states. So you can see we've got some of the more populous states on here, Texas, California, Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, plus the Northeastern states that were hardest hit. Uh, I don't have Louisiana on this chart, but they'd be right here around Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Louisiana was one of the non-Northeast states that was hit hard early with Mardi Gras in February, 2020. That turned out to be a, a super spreader event. So the fatality rates per thousand, we have Texas and California and Florida, Washington, all in single digits. And while at the other extreme, we have New York, New Jersey, and the Big Apple. And New York and New Jersey both at about 150, 175 per 100,000 fatality rate already at that point in the pandemic. So you can clearly see how hard hit the Northeast states were in the initial wave of the pandemic. In subsequent slides, we'll see how well or poorly various other states dealt with the challenges. Now let's fast forward to the year end. Here we have the OECD again with the four Pacific Rim countries, here we in New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, and Australia, continue to top the chart. So here's population, the blue bar, and fatality rate, the gold bar. They were joined in the top 10 by four of the five Scandinavian countries, Norway, Iceland, Finland, and Denmark. Sweden had actually moved up into the third quartile, but Sweden still had a much higher fatality rate, 85.3 per 100,000. Israel, Germany, and Canada 
are at 13, 15, and 16, respectively. Canada, for whatever reasons, has managed the pandemic well consistently throughout. Germany managed it quite well through the initial nine months of the pandemic, but then, like the rest of Central Europe, got hit hard with the fall surge that really hurt some of the Central European countries, especially Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovenia. Here in the U.S., as of December 31st, again, we've got the, the blue bar is population, the gold bar is fatality rate. You see the, at the far end are New York and New Jersey uh, with the highest fatality rates in the country, followed by Massachusetts. But that's some new information. Louisiana and the Northeast continue to be up at the top of the graph, but they were joined by North Dakota, South Dakota, Mississippi, and some others. There was a Sturgis motorcycle rally in South Dakota back in August for 10 days that ended up being a super spreader event on steroids. The Kaiser Family Foundation epidemiologist Josh Michaud commented, quote, holding a half million person rally in the midst of a pandemic is emblematic of a nation as a whole that maybe isn't taking the novel coronavirus as seriously as we should, end quote. On a positive note, in December, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine received an emergency use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration on December 11th, and one week later, Moderna received its EUA. Uh, President Biden was inaugurated on January 20th, 2021, uh, and declared war on the pandemic, but during, on Inauguration Day, the death toll surpassed 400 Americans who perished from the disease. Six months later, a totally different picture with some consistency. We continue to see the four Pacific Rim countries containing the pandemic. Although with, during June, we heard concerns about some outbreaks in Australia and uh, concerns about some outbreaks in Japan with the pending Olympics. Both of those relate to the fact that both countries have a very low vaccination rate. And as we noted earlier, the Delta variant is now spreading like wildfire. Uh, so although those are concerning events, those countries still lead the world in terms of uh, protecting their residents from the virulent disease. Uh, the four Scandinavian countries continue in the top 10 and they're followed by Turkey, Canada, and Israel. The US, for the first time moved out of the bottom quartile, we're now 28 of 37. Uh, that's the highest ranking we've been able to attain. Our second April issue summarized articles uh, about the pandemic that was raging in Brazil, India, and Hungary. Uh, to put those in perspective, Hungary is last in the OECD. You see what happened between June and December, countries like Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary hit very hard by the fall surge managed to surpass the Belgians as worst in the OECD. Hungary is a particularly poor example of how not to deal with a pandemic, and we covered that in detail in an article that summarized in the April issue. But let's think about where the, the, they are in the total picture, because Brazil and India are not part of the OECD. If India were part of the OECD, its current fatality rate, as bad as that disease has been in the country, with well over 300,000, 400,000 deaths at this point, probably understated, it would have ranked eighth between Finland and Denmark. It would have been right around here on the OECD rankings. Brazil, on the other hand, would have ranked, uh, ranked higher. Brazil has had a uh, much higher fatality rate, 241.9 per 100,000. So it would have ranked just above Hungary and after the Czech Republic in those rankings. The final slide that we'll talk about really looks at the pandemic over time in five major countries and what the OECD average. As most of you know, I've spoken and written widely on uh, universal health systems with particular emphasis on France, Germany, and the UK, each of which has a different approach, but uh, economies and demographics quite similar to ours here in the United States. So I tracked those three countries and added Canada to the equation for a couple of reasons. One, they're our nearby neighbor to the north and we share a lot in common uh, in terms of our approaches to democracy. But Canada was also what we kept hearing about in the presidential campaign from uh, Senator Sanders and Senator Warren and others about the need to go to Medicare for all and emulate the Canadian system. 
So let's look at how these countries fared. The first time I did this chart, I had also included data for the four Nordic nations. Now, if you think about Canada, Canada's population is about the same as California. If you add up the four Nordic nations, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark, their population is about the same as Texas, so it's reasonable to consider putting it on a chart. When I put the Nordic nations on this chart, you couldn't tell the difference between them and Canada. So the track was exactly the same. They, as a group, the four Nordic nations and then Canada contained the pandemic quite well. Then we had a fall surge that really hit everybody. This is the, the fall of uh, 2020. But Canada continues to do quite well. Germany early on, uh, partly because uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel was a scientist, uh, with a lot of credibility. She's just finished a 16-year term as chancellor. Germany did very well early on, but again, they were hit with the fall surge that hit Central Europe very hard. And so they've struggled since, but still doing better than the OECD average uh, or French, UK, and the US. The UK is an interesting chart to look at because remember we said they stumbled badly out of the gate. You can see here they were, they were climbing steadily. They managed to control it well during the summer of 2020 and this is when the alpha variant first appeared in uk uh, the alpha variant first appeared in the uk so the alpha variant infections and fatality rates were climbing at an astronomical rate right about here prime minister boris johnson implemented a radically a very aggressive vaccination program of getting the first vaccine administered and in that case, it was the fires of BioNTech, and holding off on the second. And as you can see, the uh, strategy that he employed worked, because since beginning of March, the UK pretty much has flatlined. Well, now they're coping with the Delta variant, as is the rest of the world, but there's, it's, it's like the uh, TV show, The Naked City, you say there are 8 million stories in, in The Naked City. Well, there are probably 37 different stories in the OECD, plus some others that we've discussed in three minute reading. So that's, that's the picture. Here we are in the US, where are we at June 30? I keep watching the state on this chart. And they were the first where we saw a case and they were the first to have a major outbreak. Yet throughout the pandemic, the state of Washington has managed to stay at the bottom of the chart in the US. Uh, I'm sure some academics are gonna study Washington's response, provide us with some uh, information as to what they did to manage through the pandemic so effectively. But other states, Georgia, Nevada, North and South Dakota, Arizona, and Mississippi now have fatality rates above the U.S. average of 189.1 per 100,000. So this is where we are in absolute numbers with, again, New Jersey at the high end of the chart, uh, just where Hungary is in the OECD. But what we took a look at was what happened between June 2020, when we knew what we were dealing with, and June 2021. And that slide shows a slightly different picture. Oops. Here we go. This is the change in fatality rate between June 30, 2020 and June 30, 2021, for 12 states that we tracked. So you can see that in Washington state, the fatality rate increased by 60 per 100,000. In Georgia, at the other extreme, it was almost 180 per 100,000. So Metro New York, the Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, kept the disease somewhat under control, especially when you compare it with states like Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Georgia at the far end of the chart. So while we haven't tracked all 50 states, it's clear that within the U.S., Washington State probably has done the best job of all the states in protecting its residents. The Northeastern states hit hard early on, also performed well during the, the year that just ended, June 30. The good news is that the latest data indicate that more than 99% of current COVID-19 infections are among unvaccinated Americans. So listen to your doctor's advice. If you haven't already done so, get vaccinated. The life you save may be your own. Ed? Well, I want to thank you, John, for bringing up all the statistics that compare the United States with itself and other nations. And it all goes back to the importance of mitigation to begin with, that we saw done so well uh, in the nations of the Pacific Rim. 
And then all of the efforts to vaccinate people in order to bring down the infection and death rates. And, you know, it's the same same song that the public health officials led by Dr. Fauci have been sharing with us since the very beginning of this. Mitigation without vaccination and then vaccination after mitigation can bring the pandemic to an end. But that can't happen unless we have a great deal of cooperation among public health officials uh, around the United States and around the world. Thanks, Ed. In our previous podcast, we talked about a survey and asked a lot of you to participate. Well, the Healing American Healthcare Coalition's healthcare coverage survey report is available at our website. Yes, I wanted to just point out, John, that in one of our future podcasts, we'll go through the data that we learned through that survey. We'll continue to cover the topics that we've covered today. And if there are particular interests that you'd like to see us probe, please feel free to contact us. Here's our contact information. And we'll see you next time.